All right, as you've already seen, today is very different. Well, there we go. Uh, today is very different, and that's all right. We do like to do this every year. Take just a little while to, Adam, you're going to need that. Take just a little while to appreciate um, our children and to recognize them and those who help. And one of the things that's important that we do is try to involve them in the service. And so uh, more than just performing, but actually being a part of helping lead in worship. And so in just a minute, um, I'm actually going to have a handful of those kids are going to come up and they're going to help me with my sermon. Uh, so uh, that'll be good. But before they do, just a moment to kind of remind you who we are and what we're about here at Malvern Hill. I'm so glad that you're here. If you're a guest with us, I'm thrilled to death that you made time to be with us. Um, it would mean a lot to us if you would take a moment this this morning and fill out one of the welcome cards that Adam already mentioned, whether you do it in your in your worship folder there, or the bulletin, or if you do it online at malvernhill.org slash connect. Either one will be excellent, but it just gives us a record of your visit. Uh, also a reminder, for those of you that do that are part of our children's ministry, whether you have children in the ministry or you participate in that ministry, there's a luncheon after when you, word, and we would love for you to hang around and eat some chicken with us uh, and enjoy that time of fellowship together. Uh, here at Malvern Hill, there's three things that we primarily try to be about. We love God, love one another, and we seek to change the world. We love God by gathering in worship. We love one another by gathering with our life groups. And we seek to change the world by giving and going. So when you look at all these kids, just know that when you make your tithes and offerings here at Malvern Hill, you help to support children's ministry. You help to support student ministry. You also help to support the missions that go out of here. And so today, for instance, we have a group of uh, folks from our church who are serving in Scotland right now. They're part of a larger team. There's eight or ten from Malvern Hill that are a part of that ministry being led by Brian Garbade. And you guys help to support that. Because of your tithes and offerings, you actually help to support every mission team that goes out of here. So I appreciate the way that you continue to invest in your church. Uh, a few other things. Uh, please be reminded, today is the day that we're emphasizing our kids start school, our public school kids start school on Thursday. Um, and so we do an annual back to school prayer walk. Um, and what we do with this, these prayer guides are available at several places throughout the church. They've also been emailed out to you. Um, this is on your own. But what we ask you to do is make time today uh, at some point to go to one or several of our schools with your family, with your life group, all by yourself, whatever's good for you. But gather with a few people, usually it's best. Go to a couple of those schools and just pray over the ministry that will take place there. Uh, those, our schools are, are mission fields and opportunities for teachers and students to make an impact. So y'all pray for them as they get started back to school. I uh, hope that you will do that. And then just one last reminder, we don't have children's worship because it's Children's Sunday. We do have nursery, um, so that is available uh, for you today if you need it. Uh, but those are the things. All right, having said all of those things, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and turn with me to Psalm 127, and I'm going to read that psalm to you, and then I'm going to have some helpers come up here on the stage to help me. So Psalm 127, I'm going to read the entire psalm. This is our last Sunday in the Psalms. Next Sunday, we have one sermon out of the book of Job, and then the following week, we start in 1 Peter, and we'll be in 1 Peter through November. Psalm 127, I'm going to ask you to stand with me in honor of God's word. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb, a reward like arrows in the hands of a warrior, are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for loving us and thank you for these children. Father God, I pray that you would help us this morning, that as we hear this word, that we would, like James, uh, urge us not be merely hearers of the word, but doers, God. May we make an impact with what you'll do through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Okay, I've got a handful of kids who have volunteered to help me with my sermon. This would be when you want to come up here and hang out with me. I know it's terrifying. Look at you guys. Awesome. All right. So I have a bag of tricks. All right. So this morning, y'all get in line so everybody can see how cute you are. Awesome. 
Excellent. Okay. So this morning we're going to be talking about children and how children are a, a, a heritage or a treasure. When the Bible uses that word heritage, it actually means inheritance. Same kind of word there. So our children are a treasure from the, from the Lord. And so what I have in this bag, and I'm going to let you reach in and pull out whatever you want. There's even some stuff in this little pouch right here if you want to go in the pouch, okay? You just get to reach in and pull out a treasure, all right? And we're going to explain why it's so important, okay? Does that sound like a plan? All right, so you get to go first, okay? You can reach down in there. You got some options. What do you want? Oh, good choice. Good choice. So, hold it up. It's a book. It looks like an annual, like a yearbook, but it's not. You know what this book is? You have no idea. This is, this is the most valuable book I own because it is my dissertation. Do you know that no one other than me has ever read this book? That's it. Just me. Do you know that what makes this book so valuable is not the money, but all of the blood, sweat, and tears that went into it? Do you know that? That's what it's really about. So there's different kind of value in the life. This book is valuable because of all the things that I learned when I was writing it. So you get to hold that. Excellent. Hold it up real big. I want everybody to appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Kirby, reach in there. What you got? Oh, good choice. Good choice. Oh, that one's pretty. Hold it up. Oh, man. What is that? All right. Oh, this is, I forgot how big this is, Kirby. This thing's bigger than you. All right. I've got to turn it right side up. Now tell everybody what that is. I wish I could see his face. <laughs> this is a batik print from Indonesia. And uh, why is this valuable to me? Do you know? Is, is it valuable to you? You don't like it at all. It's valuable to me. It's valuable to me because, uh, because I got it when I was on a mission trip there. And it reminds me of the incredible need for us to go with the gospel, right? Uh, so the cool thing about Batik, you got to turn around so everybody can see. Turn around, look. You got to turn, oh, you can turn it around. I guess that would be smarter. Look, it's the same on the front and the back, isn't it, Kirby? That's what makes it Batik. It's cool. All right, reach in here. What else? We got some really cool stuff in here. What you got? A strong choice. Strong choice. Look at that. Look at that. That, that football, thank you. That is my high school football jersey. Do you know it's not worth anything to anybody on planet Earth except me? Do you know that? But it's valuable, right? It's, treasure. it's a treasure to me. I wanted to preach in it, but Angela vetoed that idea. All right. So you got to go into this pocket right here, and there's some options there. Oh, that's a good one. All right, that is a 50-cent bracelet, and yet it is worth a fortune to me. Why is that bracelet so important to me? Do you have any idea? Because it has a Bible verse on it. Here, let's read that Bible verse. Can you read it? Yep. I will not leave you as orphans. That's what it says. It says, I will not leave you as orphans. John 14, what is it? Come on, man. John 14, 18. 14, 18. Yeah. So that verse, that, that, that uh, bracelet means a ton to me because we got those made when we uh, adopted our two youngest kids. And so even though this bracelet is only worth 50 cents, it means the whole world to me because it reminds me of what God did to complete our family. So this is an awesome gift. All right, I got a couple other things in here, right? One other thing, one last thing. I told y'all I was going to bring some of Miss Angela. Y'all can put it back in the bag. I told y'all I was going to bring some of Miss Angela's most expensive things. Do you know she wouldn't let me? I got, I got cold feet. Kirby, I reached into the china cabinet this morning, and I reached for her favorite crystal candlesticks. They're beautiful, and I got scared, and I left them in there, and instead we got something else. I'm not going to lie. So the last thing here, do you all know what this is? Um, no. What is that? Is, that a Barbie doll dress? is it a Barbie doll dress? That would be cool. No. Is it, is it like a cloth? It is a cloth. It's just a handkerchief. You use it where? At a funeral. At a funeral. Mercy sakes. Some people thought it was kind of like this because it was used at our wedding, which is kind of the same thing. <laughs> You're killing me. You are your father's child, aren't you? All right. Hey, so, so this is cool. So this is actually, so when you get married, you got all these weird, weird little traditions that people do. So like sometimes a bride likes to have something old, something new, something borrowed, and something blue. You ever heard that before? And so this is something Angela actually carried in our wedding. And this belonged to her grandma, who she loved a whole lot. And so she keeps this as a reminder of who her grandma was and what she meant. All right, cool deal. All right, you guys can go be seated, and I'll explain all this stuff just a little bit. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. So what do we notice? There's a lot of things in here that... that um, that I have uh, listed as 
as valuable. Do you know none of these things have material value? I mean, I mean, none of these things at an auction would be worth anything. I mean, there's a 25-year-old football jersey that's mine because they were giving them away because they were worn out, you know? Um, there's a handkerchief that is so thin, nobody wants to use it for anything. And honest and truly, most people wouldn't be interested in my dissertation for anything other than kindling. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's treasure here. And yet as valuable as all of this is to my heart and to my family, like it, it really amounts to zero in the world's eyes. You know, I think as we think about our children as a treasure, we have to be careful that we don't necessarily commodify them. Right? They're a treasure to us, but not in some kind of strange economic sense. They're a treasure to us because they're a gift from the Lord. And so as, as the psalmist explains this at the end of Psalm, 20, Psalm 127, he says they're like arrows in the hands, right, of, of their father, right? Arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children of one's youth. He says, your children become a blessing for you, right? They become a blessing. They actually become an, an opportunity for you to be defended. They become an opportunity for you to be whole and fulfilled. And this is what we get. So as we consider this sermon this morning, we're going to come back to some of these treasure things at the end. But this morning, I've titled this sermon, Do the Hard Thing. And I asked this question, whose house are you building? Any of y'all watch the Olympics yet? Anybody? Nobody? Okay, I have. We watched. And, and so the Olympics are cool because there's some things that, like, at least in theory, I could pull off. I mean, I have ran before. So when I watch them run, like, I, oh, well, they run the 100 meters faster than me, but I've at least ran the 100 meters. So I have an idea of what they're accomplishing with that, or, or perhaps when they swim. I mean, I've swam before. I obviously can't do what they do, but, but then there are other things that they do that just blow my mind. We watched, we watched men's gymnastics last night, you know, and, and maybe I could fool myself into believing that I could at least, like, get on the pommel horse and hold myself there for a few minutes, but when you see those guys work on the parallel bars or you see them work on the high bar, it's unbelievable, and then they hit the floor routine, and they do things, they do things that are just, I can't do it on a trampoline, you know, there's no chance for me. How do they get there? They get there because they've sacrificed so much to get in that particular place in life. We think about what it looks like for us to raise children. What it looks like for us to create organizations and cultures where children can thrive. I want you to know that if you're going to build God's house in your home or we're going to build God's house in this church body, it's going to require discipline and it's going to require work. And we're fooling ourselves if we believe that's not the case. Three things I want us to walk away from this passage of scripture. Kids, I don't want y'all to fall out on me because I'm going to come back to y'all in the middle of this. So y'all make sure you pay close attention. Um, First thing this morning, I want to encourage you to trust God with your household. Trust God with your household. Now, this passage, I'll be honest, it's a little boring in the, in the big sense of the Bible word, right? Because there's stories in the Bible that are just wild. I mean, you got David and Goliath. you got these warrior stories. you got miracle stories. I mean, you got Jesus coming back from the dead. And in this passage of Scripture, you just got, hey, I want to make sure that you uh, allow God to be a part of the building of your home. Like, this is a very ordinary passage of scripture, but it's important because part of trusting God with your household is, is going to involve you being willing to see God in the ordinary, to see God in the normal, the very relatively mundane things. Like, like to see God in the ordinary means that we're going to be willing to see God early in the morning. We get up and spend time in his word. I'm going to see God in a, in a happy marriage. I'm going to see God in raising my children well and, and carrying them to the church. I'm going to see God in all of these little ways. Because the greatest ways that you're going to impact your children and other children, I'm going to tell you what, it's, it's going to be through the ordinary things of life. Your greatest impact is probably not going to come through those one big extraordinary thing that's going to happen. It's going to happen in the little things that you do. It's going to happen as they see you, mom and dad, actually opening God's word and being shaped by it on a regular basis. It's going to happen when they catch you in prayer. It's going to happen when they catch you singing praises to the Lord or speaking about the Lord. Right? Those, those are some of the great things that are going to happen. I had a, a friend that accidentally overheard his dad on the phone. I should say he didn't accidentally overheard. You know how it is now. We don't get to hang the phone up. Maybe if you get mad, you slam the phone. And you do, y'all, y'all, some of y'all aren't old enough to appreciate the joy that that brings. Um, but I had a friend, and, and uh, he um, his, finished his phone call with his dad, and his dad didn't, didn't hang up. He didn't push in, and he just put the phone in his pocket, and he continued to talk. And he talked about what a joy it was for him because he eavesdropped on his dad's conversation. 
And so there he was having an opportunity to hear his dad sort of as a secret spy listening in. And he said what he heard from his dad as he went about that business uh, thing that he was dealing with in that day was he heard him speaking about the Lord and speaking about his family. He said, it was such an incredible privilege for me to discover, to know that the man that I knew was also the same man when he didn't know I was listening, right? The the, the things that we're going to impact our families with are going to be the ordinary things that we're going to do, the ordinary times that we're going to spend in the Word of God, the ordinary days that we're going to show up to worship, the ordinary Wednesday nights when we're just going to get there. Trust God with your household. The Bible says that unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, uh, who build it, labor in Vain. God's got to be in the middle of this. You've got to see him in the ordinary, but it's not just that you see him in the ordinary. You've got to pray for God to do what only God can do. Do you know there are just things that I desire desperately for my children that I'm not in charge of or control over? Since my children were born, I've prayed for their spouse. I don't know who their spouse is. None of my children have yet agreed to arranged marriages. So, um, I mean, I would love to know ahead of time who that spouse is, to be a part of helping to shape that child, but all of my children have bucked me on that idea, and I don't appreciate it. Um, But I I don't know who that's going to be. But do you know that I'm trusting the Lord does know, and I'm praying that God is at work in the life of that person. I can't control all the things that will happen in my children's future. I can't control what's going to happen in my future. You understand? But I can trust God with the things that only God can do. Y'all, some of you are robbing yourselves of sleep because you're trying to control God's things in your power. He says, he says, it is vain if you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. How does he give them that sleep? He gives them that sleep when we give him his responsibilities and we stop trying to take them on for ourselves. We're giving them over to him. It's it's vain for us. It's worthless for us to do these things in our own strength. Instead, we're coming regularly and giving these things. So y'all, trust God with the things that only God can do. And trust him with your household. Bathe your family and your household in prayer. The second thing this morning I want to encourage you to do is this. Do not neglect your responsibility. Do not neglect your responsibility. Uh, Now look, this is a psalm of Solomon. And this is important. Um, it's, It's a psalm of wisdom. And if we know something, the Bible says that Solomon was given greater wisdom than anybody else that had ever lived. And yet, if you know a little bit more about Solomon, what you discover is that over time, even though Solomon knew all of the right things, he rejected almost every single one of them. Parents, the greatest danger for those of you who are sitting in this room today is not that you wouldn't know the right thing. It's that you would engage in the sin of Solomon, which is to know all of the right things and to choose to do the wrong things anyway. Solomon strayed so far from God's design for his life that when he died, his family was completely fractured. As a matter of fact, not only was his family fractured, he strayed so far from God's life that when, or from God's plan, that when he died, the kingdom of Israel was fractured and it was torn in two. And that all happened as a result of Solomon's unwillingness to obey the things that he knew God had called him to do. Parents, let me urge you this morning do not neglect your responsibility. Look, God's grace is no excuse for your laziness. Now, we can acknowledge, for instance, that Paul writes to Timothy and says that a man who doesn't work to feed his family is worse than an unbeliever. Paul also says that if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. And we know those things to be true. Laziness cannot be celebrated. But y'all, I'm not primarily speaking to you this morning about your responsibility to provide financially or or physically for your children. I want to encourage you to not lean on God's grace as an excuse for you to be lazy spiritually as a parent. Y'all, I have heard parents make the argument before that they didn't need to discipline their children or that they needed to be super lenient with their teenage children because God is graceful and they're just trusting that the Lord is going to bring them back around. Y'all, that is lazy and unbiblical. And it is a perversion and a distortion of the understanding of what God's grace is. God has commanded us to discipline our children, to raise them in the fear and the understanding, fear and knowledge and admonition of the Lord. We have these responsibilities to create safe havens, fences, structures, and guards for our children. That is your duty. That is your responsibility as a parent. We've got to do it. 
Part of what this passage tells us is that the Lord builds the house, but then what, is, what else does he say? Unless uh, those who build it build in vain. Look, there's God's part, and God will do his part 110%. You need not worry about that. But he does not absolve us from our responsibility to build. If we just take an earthly, um, earthly illustration, God is part of the building of a home, but there are still actual bricklayers who are doing the physical work. Parents, you're called upon to be laying the bricks in your home, laying the bricks for your children in your community. You've got to not neglect your responsibility. Not only is it that you need to make certain that you, um, that, that you aren't using this as an excuse for, God's la- or for, for your own laziness, God's laziness. God's not lazy, I promise, my fault. Um, but, but watch this. The work that God has for your life and your family involves disciplined effort. Disciplined effort. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Paul says he disciplined his body lest after preaching to others he might become disqualified. Do you know that parenting is hard? Parenting is hard. I, I just, I, I want to make sure that I say that and I say it over and over and over again. And listen to me, if it's not hard for you, you're probably not doing it right. Okay? You're probably not doing it right. And I don't say that to chastise you. My goal in this message this morning is not to beat y'all up. As a matter of fact, kids, I want to speak to y'all real quickly. Parenting is hard. Some of y'all make it harder than it should be. Because you refuse to honor God's word and to obey your father and your mother. Right? As much as I can speak to parents about their responsibility, it's appropriate that I would speak to y'all about your responsibility to honor your parents and to honor the authority that God's put into your life. But parents, listen to me. Your children are going to be mad at you for something. I just want to absolve y'all. I want you to know that. Okay? I have three teenagers in my home and one that is well on his way. They find some reason to be frustrated, embarrassed, or just, you know, tired of me every single day. As a matter of fact, this morning in the early service, I saw my own children across the sanctuary making fun of me because of the way that I was singing. I could tell they were making fun of me because they poked their friend and pointed at me in the process. Okay? They're all jealous because they don't sing as well as me. Um, But you you understand, like, your kids are going to be frustrated with you. They're going to be mad at you. Parents, let me encourage you. Choose to make them mad over the things that matter. Right? Choose to make... I see some of you parents like grinning like, ha ha, I gotcha. Now look, this is not easy. This is why on August the 14th, I'm going to have a meeting for parents. Um, it, it'll be here at the church on Wednesday night. Uh, and I'm going to bring a lot of you guys, many of you will show up into a room so we can talk about some of the things that we can do as parents that we can agree upon. Because some of what makes parenting hard is those kids are smarter than we give them credit for. And y'all tell them to do something. And they just, they just know exactly which button to push. So I say something like this. But mom, everybody else is doing this. Now some of y'all love to re- look at that sweet little child and go, I don't really care. I enjoy being the mean mother. And if that's you, man, we just cheer for you. We're proud of you. But it's hard, right? So what we're going to do is try and get a bunch of you parents into a room because what I find is that a lot of parents are are in the boat where they're going, oh, you too? I hear that a lot. Oh, oh, you too? So as the the pastor, everybody assumes that we got it all figured out and my house is just perfect. I get home, they rise up and call me blessed. I always speak to them with wonderful, loving tones that Angela just can't wait for me to get there and fluff my pillow and all the other things. And y'all, I mean, the reality is that we're just like the rest of y'all. Just like the rest of y'all. Except we have four children in our home and most of y'all don't. You understand? Like there's, there's all sorts of complication that comes along with it. And occasionally I, I have a parent that looks at me and goes, oh, you deal with that too? Y'all, I want you to know that most of the parents in here are dealing with the same things you're dealing with. So we're going to try and get you together so there can be a little bit of strength in numbers. So the next time your kid goes, oh, uh, everybody else does it this way and I'm the only one that has like an 8.30 bedtime or whatever it is, you go, actually... You're not, because here's a list of people that have a, a 745 bedtime, you know, or whatever the case might be. So just, just know that. But parents, look, don't neglect your responsibility just because it's hard. They're going to be mad at you, so choose to make them mad because you made them come to church. They're going to be mad anyway. Drag them to church. It's okay. Well, we don't want to bring them angry. I, y'all, don't, don't buy this lot. We don't want them to hate church. 
They're not hating church because you're coming to church with them and they're getting fed and they're spending time around all their friends. Right? Don't buy that lie. Don't buy that lie. Or this one. I don't want to force my beliefs on them. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You do. I mean, you, you want to force your beliefs about table manners on them. You want to force your beliefs about obeying the speed limit on them. You, you want to force your beliefs about everything else on them. Why in the world, if you believe that Jesus is the only hope for salvation for the world, if you believe that with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, why in the world would you not desire for your children to believe the same thing? You believe the stove is hot, so you don't let them touch it. You know, we invest in them. Don't neglect your responsibility. Uh, just because it's hard, I just want to encourage you to stick with it. And then third this morning, invest in the next generation. Now, listen, most of what I've talked about has been household-oriented. Do you know that we have a lot of people in this church that have invested in the children of this church that don't have children of their own? Instead, of what they've done is they've looked around and said, all these kids are mine. It's awesome. I'm so thrilled for those folks, right, who, who parent my children. I, I saw um, one of my kids this, this week at, a, at an event uh, standing there, uh, my 17-year-old standing there with his arm around one of our ladies at church and just talking with her. And I, I was just struck by how grateful I am for all the, the healthy adults that my kids have in their life, you know. Uh, and for the fact that I get to be one of those adults for some other kids. When I speak about my kids or our kids, I have to be very clear because sometimes I'm just speaking about those four Thompsons that live in my house. But a lot of times when I speak about my kids or our kids, I'm talking about like our kids at Malvern Hill. And I'm super protective over them, sometimes to a fault. I actually have to be really careful about that because like any, any hint at a slight directed towards our children really gets my ire up. And I have to be super careful to not go too far with those things. Um, but we, we have an opportunity to invest in the next generation. Not just my four children, but in all of the children that God gives us an opportunity to interact with. So you need, I want to encourage you all to think of these as your children. Now listen, when I talk about investing in the next generation, this is not a capital campaign sermon. All right? This isn't a fundraising sermon. That's coming on September 1st. You can mark your calendar. I'm going to do that then. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about things that are bigger than just writing checks. I'm talking about investing in them. Look, I want you to raise your children and the children of this church and as best we can the children of our community to fulfill a godly vision. What if we had a vision for children that was bigger than them being good ball players or good musicians? What if we had a vision for children that looked like raising them up to know the Lord and to desire to love Him and to love others and to change the world just like we try to do here at Malvern Hill? What if we raised them with a godly vision? What if we raised them with a godly vision because we knew they could be more and we expected it? What if the big problem with our children is that our expectations are too low and our willingness to engage in them is too low? What if instead we raised children? You understand? That's what it says, raising. We're raising them. That means we're not satisfied with where they are. We're trying to get them to the next step. You understand your goal is not to raise good children. Our goal of the church is not to raise good children. It's to raise godly adults. And folks, we can't consider it mission accomplished until they are godly adults who are plugged back into a local church as adults and making an investment there. That's got to be our goal. And part of that goal is expecting our investments to mature. We can actually expect this. So most of you are like me. You're investing a little bit for retirement, hoping that one day when you're like 80, you'll actually be able to retire, right? So, so the way that those investments work is you put some money in, in a fund, an account, a stock, whatever it is, and the hope, the expectation is that the, the $100 you put in there today, 20 years from now, is worth, you know, two, three, four, five hundred dollars $500. You're hoping that, that that investment is maturing along the way. That's the goal. So when we talk about children as an investment, some of y'all, that might make you a little bit uncomfortable, but he said in verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage. That word heritage also means what? An inheritance. And an inheritance comes when somebody has invested their money or their, or their things properly, and as a result, there's something left over for people down the line. So children are an inheritance that God gives to us. So we are investing back into this with the hope and the expectation that these investments would mature. Do you know that that means that we can have an expectation that middle school boys can be more than the culture tells us middle school boys can be? 
Like we actually can look at our children and say to them, it doesn't matter to me what culture says. I have greater vision and desire for you than this world does. We can actually do that. We can say that to high school boys and high school girls. We can say that to fourth graders and to fifth graders. We can say that to four-year-olds. We can say to them, it doesn't matter. Y'all can actually say what your parents said to you. I don't care what so-and-so's mama said, you know. I have different visions and dreams for who you are and what you can be, and those are my goals and my desires. Folks, listen, you can choose to throw your money away or you can expect and pray for it to mature into something greater than it is, and that's the nature of a great investment. We can choose to just flush our dreams down when we look at our kids, or we can work diligently to see them mature into something else. I really would like to preach a lot longer, but our kids are not going to give me that time, and you guys aren't either. So we're going to move right to where the rubber meets the road this morning. Are you building your house or are you building God's house? Ultimately, that's the question. And the truth of the matter is I could preach for two more hours, but the question would still be the same. Are you building your house or are you building God's house? Are you building a house that seeks to honor the Lord? Are you doing whatever is comfortable and easy for you? Are you raising children to be interested in more than excelling in sports and making good grades? Are you building a household of faith, whether that be in your home or in your church, that has expectations for children and young people? You say, Craig, why do we need this? Because y'all, I'm going to be honest with you. I can't wait for these 18-year-olds to be, to be 30 before we can count on them to make a difference and lead right here. I can't wait. The world can't wait. How many of y'all went to war before you were 20 years old? How many of you guys had a full-time job before you were 20 years old? You think about it. There's a lot that can happen. And we don't have to wait. We can actually encourage them to take the next steps and we can walk with them. The great thing is this. You ready? You're not all by yourself. The Bible says those who build on their own are building in vain. But we're not alone. God's equipped us for more. And he's surrounded us with people that will walk with us. I think Chad's going to come and play as we move toward an invitation this morning. It's really simple. Two things. Number one, there's some children here, kids, people that are still at home, that could probably stand to confess this morning that you've made it really difficult for your parents to parent you because you've spent a whole lot of time disobeying them and finding joy in it. That rather than honoring the Lord by obeying your parents, you've decided that somehow along the way your responsibility is to disobey them on a regular basis. And listen, as much as we can talk to parents, there's some of y'all that are children and teenagers here today that need to repent because you're living in sin because you enjoy being difficult for your parents. And that's sinful and you need to repent of that. There's some of your parents here today though and you just recognize the truth, right? And the truth is that you've not worked to invest in your children. You've not worked to invest in a godly vision for what your children can be. Some of you just haven't worked. Man, you've just taken the easy way out. And it's easy to do. But today you need to say, you know, it's hard as it might be, I'm going to go home and I'm going to tell my children that things are going to change. And your children are not going to love you for that. Not in the moment. But you're not raising children. You're raising adults. We're hoping for what they're going to do to change the world around them. As we sing this morning, as the Lord leads, would you respond? Stand with me as I pray. Father God in heaven, I thank you for loving us. And thank you for this word that never returns void. I pray, Lord God, that you would be at work among us. Forgive us for our sin, Lord God. And for those that need to make a shift or a change, that today could be a day of, of that change. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining with us here online at Malvern Hill Baptist Church. We would love to get to know you better and to pray with you. If you would like to be contacted for prayer or to find out how to become a follower of Christ, or maybe you just want to find out more about Malvern Hill, please fill out our connection card online at www.malvernhill.org connect. You can also go there to our website. You'll find a lot of information about our church. There's sermons, there's resources. 
There's other tools that can help you to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can even give to the work of ministry right there from our website. Thank you so much for being here with us. We hope that you can join us in person very soon. But until that time, I pray that God would bless you in this week as you seek to honor Him with your life. I hope to see you soon. Have a great week.